Hi, welcome to That's Classic. If you are interested in seeing some fantastic additional footage from my interviews, as well as receiving my newsletter, uh, please go to patreon.com slash that's classic. That's patreon.com slash that's classic. Enjoy. All right. Well, today on That's Classic, as I always say, we have a great one, but we really do. We have a fun one. Um, the uh, the gentleman that I have coming up, uh, he was uh, Chip on th um, the, my three sons, and I actually have also interviewed his brother Barry um, from uh, my three sons. So I'd like to welcome today Stanley Livingston. Uh, Stanley, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate yeah. it. Well, definitely, I'm, I'm quite excited. Like I said, I had Barry on, and it was a it was terrific. And I've been wanting to talk to you for some time, so this is. This is great. Um, great. So right out of the gates, as I like to say, um, what, uh, you know, I, after talking to Barry, Barry had a, a very like kind of, I would call it more of a business relationship with Fred McMurray kind of vibe. But when I have read about you and the fact that obviously you were on the show for 12 seasons, um, the entire mm -hmm. run with, with Fred, what was your relationship like with Fred kind of on and, you know, off the set? Yeah, he was a very cordial guy and, you know, he was very much like the character he played. You know, people always think, and, and that's true with a lot of actors, they play a character and then in real life, they're nothing like that. Um, you know, they can be nicer or they can be kind of cold and aloof. But yeah, Fred was a very nice guy and easy to get along with. I, I worked with him for 12 years, uh, nine months out of the year. And you know, on that entire time, I never saw him blew a fuse or get mad or get angry. And, and uh, you know, he had concerns about the show or sometimes the dialogue. And, you know, they were never met with a temper tantrum first. But, you know, he would tell the director, or the producer, and they'd get a writer down on the set and sit around a table. And in five, ten minutes, they'd get it worked out and we'd be shooting again. But, you know, a lot of actors start, you know, throwing furniture, throwing their scripts yeah. around and yelling and screaming at somebody and you know he, he just wasn't like that he was just a nice decent easy going guy yeah i always like to say he's just a normal guy a big movie star but he was just like the guy next door you know mm -hmm. yeah i i had uh, i i john star. davidson was on the show and he had said look fred mcmurray you know he was basically a band guy that ended up making it you know and uh that's that's really who he was he was, uh, you know, very low key. And, you know, when he came to My Three Sons, he was probably the highest paid actor in Hollywood at that time. Wow. Um, you know, just come off of uh, the Kane Mutiny, the apartment, uh, the absent minded professor, the shaggy dog. So, you know, he was at the pinnacle of his career. And that was the odd thing to most people in the motion picture industry especially from that era it's like well why would you want to go from being a movie star to just being a tv actor you know most yeah. tv actors required to be movie stars and right if they could get a position they'd never go back but he had a he had reason behind it and it was that he and his wife june uh, adopted uh, twins uh, about four or five years before that and he knew the drill of making movies is sometimes you go away for four to six months making a film somewhere and if you're a busy actor like Fred, well, you know, you might see your family a couple months out of the year and the rest of the time you're on location. So yeah. he concocted this idea in his head that, gee, if I did a TV series, um, you know, I don't know if it would be a step down or how he looked at it in the, in the scheme of things, but he could work uh, from eight to five, eight to six, go home, you know, eat dinner with his kids, watch TV and then come back to work the next morning. And then they set up a, a filming schedule that allowed him to have the summers off. So he would work for about two, three months, take off uh, for three months during the summer while we continued to work and shot all the scenes that he wasn't in, and then come back again at the end of uh, the end of the year and I don't know September, October, November, and finish off the rest of his stuff. How did and that? That's affect, what we. How did that affect you, by the way, as an actor, being on the Fred McMurray Didn't schedule? <laughs> and, you know, as an actor, we always shoot things out of sequence anyway. It just depends when sets are ready or people are available. So sometimes you shoot the ending first and shoot the middle and then go back and shoot the beginning, you know, at the end. So we were used to doing that. I mean, where it was a little more complicated was was scenes where he was actually in them and would walk out of the scene, but the scene would continue on 
except yeah. we wouldn't the part where we would continue on till six months later <laughs> uh, they'd step in with a camera and take a polaroid and go this is where you were this is what you were wearing and we'll come back and pick this up in three months so or we would shoot scenes that fred would walk into and we would do the same thing we'd shoot maybe two or three pages that he wasn't in then all of a sudden the front door would open and and Fred would walk through it like he's coming home from work. And uh, so we would shoot the first part. And when Fred came back at the end of the year, uh, we'd all get into position. And, uh, yeah, Fred would come to the door. And, and then when you cut it <laughs> together, it seemed, you know, plus you always have a cutaway. You know, we it could be yeah. a big group shot. Then you cut to the front door and Fred opens it. And you drop back to the wide shot again. And now everybody matches. So there's How little did... cinematic tricks to doing that kind of stuff. How did that affect you as, you know, you're a kid and as we all know, kids grow and, you know, you you know, things change. Uh, how did that yeah. affect you coming back That's six only, months later? That was the only issue that they couldn't control is if I had a growing spurt, which I did. Yeah. And suddenly, you know, my pants, which were cut properly, now we're up to my ankles, you know, <laughs> like because I grew two inches. Uh, yeah, they'd have to let the pants down. They kind of, you know, even anticipated things like that, though, that I was 12, 13, I might grow. I remember I, I had to buy pants that were longer and they tucked them under and, and hemmed them. Wow. And then when I did grow, they would have to, you know, let them down. But sometimes you wouldn't be a size small anymore. You'd be a size medium or, you know, whatever. Or my hair started changing, you know. Yeah, I would early imagine. Years, my hair was very blonde. And about the second, maybe the beginning of the third year, it started to get darker and they were kind of wanted to keep it blonde. So they sent me to, uh, it, where was it? Uh, uh, the, the Westmore's owned a, a, a beauty place or a makeup place. Mac, oh, it's Max Factor. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hollywood. And that, about every other Saturday, I had to go there and they put hydrogen peroxide on my hair to make it look blonde. And it, it burned the heck out of my scalp. Oh, my So we gosh. did that one next year they wanted me to go back i said i'm not doing that if i have to do that i quit i'm not doing that and so there was a big meeting and they finally realized i wasn't going to do it i wasn't going to be a very happy camper so they just yeah let my hair get darker and darker and you know it went from being a platinum blonde when the show started in 1960 to my if you look at the end of the series in 72 my hair is almost black so yeah it, it yeah. changed over time isn't that funny? and i grew up not quite as tall as Red McMurray, but <laughs> I think uh, there was always somebody told me there was a thing in Hollywood that if you became a child actor, you wouldn't grow, you know, because you wouldn't fit in the TV scene anymore. So there was a psychological. <laughs> short. That's actually really funny. Now, another thing is you had a very close and I know Barry talked about this with me as well, a very close relationship with uh, William Frawley. Um, yeah. And you, you know, it, I will tell you, I, I've had, I haven't released it yet. I'm sure my audience out there is like, what he's talking, what is he talking about? But I also spoke with Tina Cole and I'll be releasing that episode. And Tina did, had a totally different relationship than the two of you guys, um, because oh, yeah. you were there early on and all of that. What, what was he like? Um, you know, pretty much like you saw him on the show, you know, seemingly cranky and crusty, but you know, the dialogue was written for him. Otherwise, it would have been a, you know, a machine gun of four letter words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. His, his speech was, you know, peppered with profanity. And, uh, you know, he cut it loose at times. And in his frustrations, he wasn't Fred McMurray, you know, or he was like this subtle guy if he didn't <laughs> like somebody. You know, he's like, who writes this shit? You know, and he would just right. go off on a tirade and they'd still have to get the writers down and, you know, he'd berate them and, They'd still get it fixed. But yeah, a lot of it, I think he did that because he was kind of notorious for that and made people just crack up and laugh. And, you know, I think he was exploiting it to a certain degree when I look back on it and how it happened and why it happened. That it, He was entertaining people by being himself. And so he was happy to oblige. Yeah, you know, with me. Yeah, we, why you? I, I neither, you know, Barry and I, we, we didn't know our own. Um, we never met our grandfathers. They had passed oh. away by the time. And so I always wanted a grandfather. I missed that, having that element in my life. And I was a big I Love Lucy fan. And I didn't realize at first, you know, Fred, Fred Mertz is suddenly going to be Bob on the show. So, 
when I found that out, I was like, you know, beside myself because that was my favorite character from I Love Lucy. And wow. uh, so he came on the show and, you know, I set out to make him my surrogate grandfather. And I wasn't sure whether he'd warm up to me, but he did. And we just had like a fantastic relationship where, you know, every day we went to lunch together. There was a restaurant around the corner called Nicodell's, which is an old established Hollywood watering hole. And he held court there every noon. And in the same booth at the back of the place, they would hold it for him. And, you know, we'd all go in together and have lunch. It was usually about eight, 10, 12 of us back there. And uh, I always sat next to Bill. And, you know, Bill would buy me an alcoholic drink, even though it was only nine and <laughs> ten. And I was like, no, don't you drink that. And then I would kind of put it down under the table and you know, dump it out And when he wasn't looking. And oh, my God. So we kind of. You know, yeah, he was kind of a corrupt influence in my life. Yeah, we smoked a cigar together occasionally. And his, <laughs> and his... Yeah, he was, you know, the kind of grandfather you, you really wanted. He, he was everything. And, and you know, I think he, he really, really loved me. I mean, I could, I could tell, you know, that he did. Uh, I was into surfing when I was about 12, 13. And for my birthday, I think it was my 13th birthday, he bought me a Dewey Weber surfboard. I'm a and surfer. I, we... I appreciate that. We came back from lunch at Nick and Elle's and I had to go change my wardrobe and went up into my dressing room. When I opened the door, there was a nine foot Dewey Weber sitting like in there. I was like, my eyes popped out of my head. Wow. And it's a chip, you know, love Uncle Bill. Yeah. And yeah, it was, uh, I, you know, I think I cried, you know, it was so, so moving, you know, because you're thinking an old guy like that and he didn't drive. Um, yeah. You know, it would have been so much easier to open his wallet and go here's twenty dollars which would have been a lot of money in 1960 in 1963 even but it meant he was listening to me you know what i was into and what i liked and remembered it how the hell would he know i want a dewey weber surfboard i don't think i mentioned the name of it but somehow he found out that that was a good surfboard found out the size surfboard that i should be surfing with and bought this beautiful coral colored surfboard. Oh my and gosh. How did you get it? How did you get it here? You know, you don't drive. We had a driver in a car, but you know, I just can't imagine Bill Raleigh walk in this some surf shop, you know, talking to somebody because <laughs> of the dude. <laughs> you know, it's like, so man, what are you here for? You surfer? You know, I'm like, no, no, kid. And I was like, all right, man, you want to you want to smoke some of this and whatever, he, you know, somehow he got it and brought it back and, you know, put a little gift card in there. And, and yeah, I never forgot it. And then the funny wow. part is, well, it wasn't funny to me, but there was a couple other guys that were on the crew that surfed too. Mm -hmm. And yeah. our, our assistant cameraman surfed and somehow his surfboard got away from him and uh, it collided with the front of his face and knocked his front teeth out. Oh my gosh. And, the producer saw that it's like you can't surf during the production season you're banned from surfing so the surfboard ended up in our pool at home you know for about nine months a year and i couldn't wow. surf so and then probably by the next summer I wasn't into surfing anymore you know at that age you change all the time it's probably in the oh, yeah. mini by motorcycles or something boy what a great heart i mean seriously i mean i i as i told you i am a surfer and i know what a classic that uh, well first of all dewey weber is a legend and then yeah. on top of it that he went to the extent that he did uh that is something i did not expect to be honest with you that's, yeah, that's pretty it, cool you know it's funny at the time i didn't think about that you know you just think here it is he gave it to me but you know when i got older i'm going God, this guy had to go to extreme trouble to mm -hmm. find out about this and, you know, it'd be another thing if he was a younger guy and, you know, had a pickup truck or SUV and went down and, you know, bought it and threw it in the back of his truck and brought it back. But, you know, you're talking about Bill, it was like 71, 72, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, to go through all the mechanation, machinations of, of getting that surfboard and getting back, you know, it, obviously uh, he went the extra mile. As he, he loved you. There's no doubt about that. When yeah. somebody does that, they don't just do that as a casual thing. Um. Hey, by the way, I you know what? I should put this out to the people listening just so that they, in case, if you're just listening, go to www.youtube.com slash that's classic TV. And you can actually see Stanley and I talking and, and, you know, get a, get an idea of this. So just so everybody knows. 
Um, on the other side of the coin, Stanley, I, uh, you know, once again, I, you know, talking to Barry, he had this special relationship with Fred de Cordova, who obviously, you know, went on to be the uh, producer of the Tonight Show. What was your relationship with Fred? Because Fred was quite, I mean, a lot of people out there might not realize, but Fred was like majorly connected. I mean, he knew everybody. More than majorly. <laughs> yeah. Same kind of relationship. I mean, yeah, he pretty much fawned over both of us. And, you know, me being a little bit older than Barry, I, you know, I was at that time too, just getting interested in the other side of the motion picture industry. You know, I, I thought I may not just want to be an actor, but I, I was interested in directing and producing. And, you know, he was a great guy to talk to and pick his brain and how do you do this? How do you do that? And, you know, all the experiences he had and was generous with advice and, you know, just a super, super nice guy, too. And he had a very unusual personality. He was somebody that, you know, you didn't want to tangle with in a in an argument or a conversation because he put you in his place. And that, that was one of the things I respected about Fred. He treated the guy that made the coffee and got the donuts on the set the exact same way he treated Fred McMurray. No less, no more. And, you know, if. You got into it with him. He was going to put you in your place. Didn't didn't matter whether you're Fred McMurray either. And I think he'd always been wow. that way with people and that worked for him. And people had, you know, a lot of respect. And I mean, you could tell uh, there was a whole coterie of show business people that used to come to the set occasionally and, and visit Fred, you know, like Ronald Reagan would come down, George Byrne, Jack Benny, wow. Willie Shoemaker, you know, all these, you know upper wow. class of the industry type of people that he had worked with and cultivated relationships. And a lot of those guys was his card buddies. They'd play cards. So um, well, that would happen at his house. So he, he was a real mover and shaker. And, you know, I knew he was kind of at the top of the social, you know, I, the A-list, I guess you would call it, of social life in L.A. Yeah. But there was a very interesting article that I just stumbled upon Oh, uh, gosh, it was maybe a year or so ago about his, you know, the later days after, even after Johnny Carson, that I, I didn't realize he had so many problems, was having financial problems. Really? And uh, yeah, I, I was actually just stupefied that 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 was his demise, kind of. But uh, where did I read that? Vanity Fair. There's a great article. You go look it up and you wouldn't believe what happened to he and, and his wife, Janet. Uh, it kind of talked about, you know, how he was literally the pinnacle of the social, social, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. life in L.A. Uh, you know, he didn't go to people's houses. People came to his house. Right. And he and Janet, you know, held court there. And, you know, everybody was anybody would be seen there. And that was the place to be seen. And Janet was uh, she was the queen of, of all of that. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess after Fred got fired or let go from Johnny Carson, you know, the next people that came in weren't paying him the princely sum that he was being paid, uh, you know, during the Johnny Carson era. And then at the beginning of the Jay Leno era, I think that's when they let him go and decided to get somebody younger in there. But they kept him on. But almost as like punishment, you know, he's like getting scale. If you can believe wow. that, it was like a real you know, just, I mean, that's, you have to understand that's our industry. If no, I can know. put you in, I know. in your place or what they feel is your place now, they'll do it. And it was humiliating. I, I didn't realize he went through that at that point in time. And, I will look uh, for that article. Fred finally ended up at the motion picture home. And I couldn't even believe if, if the article is to be believed that he, you know, couldn't just get in there. If somebody had to get it. And, you know, I'm like, wow, if he couldn't get in, how would I get in? Well, I found out I can't because they changed all the rules. I used to be, I always envisioned I would be out there at the end of my life if something went wrong. But even I don't qualify our, our union and the things associated with it just basically discard actors like trash. Oh, my and, God. Uh, I had no idea yeah, about that. Rings were full. He got to go in there and that's where he spent his last days. And the, the real I mean, it's probably an interesting story and it's not really about me, but yeah, uh, they had a maid at their house for the whole time there. It was probably 30 years. The same lady. And she was very loyal and loved the decor. It was love Fred, love Janet. Yeah. And the whole thing went down and, and they basically were having financial problems. Yeah, Fred said, you're going to have to sell the house. And move into you know you'll probably be a 
afford a very nice condominium because the house is at the top of Truesdale Estates and yeah. uh, it was a beautiful house. And um, she didn't think she could do it or didn't know how to handle finances because Fred did all that. And, you know, she was just the head of the social stuff and that's all she wanted to do. And so this maid who they paid lavishly and, and took care of them and, you know, fought for them and sheltered them. Well, it turned out she had to give up the house. And the wow. maid said, to, don't worry about it. She goes, you can come live with me. She goes, but I'm going to have to let you go. And she goes, I know. She goes, but don't worry about it. You're going to come to Mexico and you're going to live in my house. No way. And she took, but here's the, the best part. The money that they paid her over the 30 years, she built a replica of their house in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> so she had the same bedroom, the same furniture, and this lady took care of Janet until she expired. I mean, it's, it's like totally <laughs> insane what, what happened. You know, I mean, it's just scary when you hear somebody who is, you know, at the top of the industry and then the top of the pinnacle of the, the social scene in L.A., and that's how you end up you know, going, what's going to happen to me? I'm not that guy. I'm going to end up some player. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, it is it is sad, but it is also really funny. The fact that she goes down there and there's a replica of the house. Yeah, like a replica. Of not only the house, but the, the room she had and the furniture. And I guess she just liked the way the decor was lived. And, and you know. Obviously, it didn't cost as much in Mexico as it would have if you lived at the top of Truesdale Estates on Carla Ridge. Wow. Uh, in, I don't know what city it was in, whether it was in Mexico City or Puerto Vallarta or something. But, yeah, this lady was very astute, and she did not spend the money uh, lavishly. Uh, she was thinking about her future and probably her demise at some point and, and wow. you know, built this very lovely house down there. And, you know, but it's just so funny that I, I was like, gosh, this would be like a great play or a great movie. Oh, where these incredible. Wealthy, incredible. wealthy people end up living in their maid's house who was taking care of them and now really is taking care of them. It, you can't like they always say you can't you can't write stuff like this. I mean, you try, no. but, but you could no. never write that. No, I agree. So yeah, what? Yeah, it, it, Check, check this. It's very, it's a long article. So there's a lot of detail about what went on and all this other stuff that was kind of swirling around that and a lot of information about the decorders that I, I will, you know, I do Fred fairly well, but you know, this is right. kind of more on the, uh, almost like a, uh, an atomic level. <laughs> the oh, it's amazing. Level of us. That's an incredible story. So what about um, the other one is, uh, you know, William Demarest comes in yeah. and, you know, also very established actor as well. But I know that, you know, once again, through talking to Barry, that transition wasn't exactly like, oh, great. Here's William Demarest. You guys had such a tight bond with Frawley. What was that like? What was the process? Uh, exactly like how it happened. You know, one day Frawley's out and the next day there's other guys there. You know, it wasn't like a you know, an easy going, we'll, we'll just kind of shoe you in or slip you into the role. You know, it's one day, the one guy's there and the next day he's not there anymore and he got replaced. You know, it, it wouldn't have meant very much to me at a later point in time had I been in my late teens when because, you know, I'd worked enough by then and on different things and seen actors replaced. Sure. Like I have a funny story about Barry. Remind me after I tell you this and we'll talk about the thing. Barry. But uh, yeah, you know, they couldn't get Fred, uh, Fred couldn't get Bill Frawley insured. So they decided they had to let him go. And that was primarily because we didn't shoot episode by episode. We were shooting in five different episodes a day. And they worried that, you know, we could shoot out 10, 12 episodes. And what if he dies? I'm going to start all over. All his roles would, uh, you know, would have to be replaced by somebody else. So, you know, yeah, I heard he, he died. Had no heartbeat. It, I mean, it was like crazy yeah. on it. And his health. It's a good kind of heartbeat on him. <laughs> it was so shallow, I guess, at that point. But uh, yeah, the, it was a you know, financial decision that the insurer said, we, we can't insure him. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, he could collapse and die at any moment. And if you're shooting like you're shooting and not segment by segment, you know, you shot two segments and he died. Great. You go on and get a new guy for the third segment. Yeah, that's a and big keep risk. going. Yeah. In the, the case with Fred. So they let him go and it was sad. And because of my age, I guess I was about 14. I, I was very, very upset. Uh, well, number one, that he wasn't going to be there anymore. And and number two, that this guy who came in was taking my friend's job. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so I wasn't rude to him, but I didn't warm up to him. It took me maybe a year or so you know to That's realize a long what time. 
wasn't his fault and he filled Bill Bill Frawley's shoes very well and, and I think Peggy wanted to work with him because he had worked with uh, from Nick Murray many times and he was cut from the same cloth you know he was one of those crusty old guys on camera in fact Bill Frawley was more like his character you saw on TV only more of it when the camera when they said cut Bill Demers, that was kind of a, just a character and off screen. He was a completely different guy. He was just low key, nice. He wasn't yelling and cursing. And you know, he was a completely different kind of guy. Was he warm and, to you and Barry? Yeah, yeah, he really was. And, you know, as I got older and older, we became closer and closer. And even after the show was over, I, I used to go down to Palm Springs a lot and, you know, drop in on him or visit him and have lunch or talk or, you know, he's just a really nice guy. How wonderful and to hear that. To be honest, he was probably a bigger movie star than Bill Frawley. Now, Bill mm -hmm. Frawley worked in the movie industry, but his, you know, celebrity really came from being on I Love Lucy and that whole phenomenon where Bill Demros was a bona fide movie star. You know, he did all those Preston Sturges films. He was right. one of the top second bananas in the movie industry, you know, was maybe the lead, but he was always the best friend of, of the main guy or the main detective hunting down oh, you know, the bad guy. I've seen guy. him in so many detective roles. Yeah. Oh. And the funny part about the two of them, they, they looked the same, you know, when they were yeah. like 30 as they did when they were 80. And now you go, geez, you're like, I'd like to see a picture of you in kindergarten. They probably looked the same way. You know, they yeah, just looked good, old. It's a good point. So what was the story about Barry? You said, tell me, remind oh, me. And, you know, be with an actor and then, you know, Two weeks later, they're gone and replaced. I did a movie early in my career uh, called Rally Around the Flag Boys. With, oh, with uh, uh, Paul, Paul Newman. Newman. Yeah, Joe yeah, yeah. Woodward. And yeah, when I got cast, you know, there was a bunch of kids. And then I remember at the end of the casting session, you know, there was a bunch of us and they let everybody go and asked me to stay. And I stayed. And um, so I said, well, you have the part. And uh, anyway, so my mom was there and because and, she didn't have a babysitter, she had Barry there. And so, you know, we we're talking and, and the casting guys like, well, who, who's this little kid here? And they go, oh, that's Stan's brother, Barry. And they go, oh, well, this is great because we're looking for another kid to play the younger brother. Wow. And so, guess who got the part? Barry. Um, so the first day of shooting, we're shooting the film and the director was Leo McCary. I don't know oh, if you know who he is. Big director. He's the guy that put Laurel with Hardy and, you know, that whole phenomenon happened. Yeah. But uh, we supposed to be watching a tv set uh, paul newman walks in in the background comes up and starts talking to us so we our directorial um challenge was to not look at him not laugh just stay watching the tv set and ignore him so we did and then but he started ragging on barry saying hey look uh, i need you to look right at the tv set i don't want to see you looking here i don't want to see you looking there right at the tv set don't move your eyes off of this we shot it again and he went up to Barry, he goes, you're not listening to me. I need you to look directly at the TV set. You're you're looking over here. And Barry oh goes, God. I'm not. But you are. I'm, I can see it. <laughs> so shot it again and again. And I could see Lou McCare is really getting frustrated. And, you know, I'm just three years older than him. So it was hard for me to really calculate what was going on. Wow. Anyway, they sent Barry to an eye doctor during the lunch break. And it turned out they discovered my brother had crossed eyes. So it was wow. never going to look like it was looking at the TV set. And a decision was made on the spot that they did not want Paul Newman to have a, a kid with crossed eyes. And by one o'clock, I had a new brother. Wow. And we had to shoot it all over again. Yeah. yeah. Wow. What the irony of that whole thing is, is your brother is so well known for being that guy with the glasses that... Yeah. It actually, it's one of those classic moments in life where it's like, oh, that's a bummer. And then it actually turned into a good thing down the road, you know? It, well, it was that rally around the flag that, you know, you say, think sometimes things are, wow, how horrible you lost the job and now you right. got to wear glasses. It was sort of serendipity that that happened because after that, his career really took off because most of the kids trying to get into showbiz or that were working that time did not wear glasses. And this gave him a very distinctive look. And he kept going out on interviews with the glasses. And he kind of, he, he sort of became the quintessential nerd you know, oh, for a little kid. Without a doubt. So he'd get parts where he was like a child genius or, you know, a smart guy. And, uh, you know, with his Mr. Moto haircut and buck teeth. <laughs> he had a, but, oh, look, but he was adorable. He you was. Know, and it worked 
So sometimes in show business, uh, you don't know what's going to work for you. And you just fall into that by, like I said, serendipity that yeah. something changes and they ask you to do something and, you, you know, you, you go with it as all instead of fighting it. Did you, um, you know, it's hard to talk about uh, that movie and not, you know, you mentioned Paul Newman. I mean, possibly one of my very favorite actors of all time. You were young, granted, but do you recall uh, what he was like on the set and what, what he was like as a man? You know, not in its entirety, but I mean, you know, how he dealt with child actors, you know, he, he seemed to be, hey, come up and talk to us. And it probably behooved him to do that because otherwise, you know, we had no sense of, oh, you know, we're working with a huge movie star. You know, it's just a guy playing our dad as far as we're concerned. And, yeah. you know, I, I probably didn't know who he was. So, you know, he, but he seemed to be a nice guy, congenial and kind of, you know, would talk to us and kid around and stuff like that. Basically, so we would establish some kind of rapport. So it wasn't just like, okay, I'm playing your dad. You don't know me really, but exactly. I'm playing your dad. He's a smart and actor. Distance there. So yeah, he did that. And Joanne Woodward did the same thing. Or when I did Please Don't Eat the Daisies, you know, Doris Day went way out of her way to kind of bond with us so that we had a relationship when it came time to shoot that, you know, we would feel comfortable coming up to her, hugging her, her putting her arm around us and us not, you know, jumping back like, who are you? Uh, like yeah, so I, that would have been pretty warm, Doris Day. Yeah. 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 Uh, but again, as a child actor, you, you know, you're working with giant people in the movie industry and, you know, you, that's probably why kids are natural. They have no conception of the place in the industry that these people are at. And you're just reacting to another person reacting to you. So it, it's very, wow. very, well, as long as it's a nice person, you know, somebody yells at you, then it was to be a kind of an off-putting relationship, so to speak. Yeah. What about um, going back to my three sons, you know, then we have Don Grady, um, you know, what was your relationship with Don as, you know, obviously he's the older, you know, mm -hmm. the older of, of uh, the three. Um, what was your relationship with Don? Um, you know, it was brotherly in a way, but I mean, we weren't close. We were closer later. Uh, you know, it looked like Don was more like 14, 15, and I was the nine-year-old where yeah. he was actually set going on 18 at the beginning of the show. He was older than he seemed, and I, I thought, oh, wow, this guy's going to be cool. He'll be in the schoolroom. Well, what I didn't know was that summer he was graduating from high school, so I was left all alone in the schoolroom by myself. Wow. And yeah, you know, on the set, he was a pretty cool guy, and he was into his music, and Eventually, I guess a couple of years later, I, I got into music and, you know, he showed me how to play guitar and chords. And he had a piano upstairs, electric piano, which he was always up there writing music and practicing. Uh, but yeah, it, it was a good relationship, you know. Uh, the one I probably had the closest relationship with, though, was Tim Considine. He oh, played yeah. the original older brother, Mike, on the show. And maybe because he was older, uh, he, you know, he just looked at us as younger kids and, you know, he even off screen, he was the guy that would come over to our house on Saturday, pick us up, take us to his mom's house, go swimming in her pool or take us to a, a drive in and eat lunch, you know, and get them all. Really? He, yeah. He was a nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. And he was a car nut. So that was his thing. Uh, when we knew back in those days, he had a D Jaguar and then he had a 300 SL going Mercedes Oh. He had all these really cool cars, so we always wanted to be around those cool cars, or he'd take us like to auto shows with him, and so that relationship uh, continued till he left. And but even after he left, we stayed in contact. Uh, you know, when the show was over, I guess I was an adult. I was like twenty two, twenty three, but we were still in contact, and you know, we'd see each other at events or a couple times a year. Or there'd be a party or something. But then he started having an annual birthday party for himself on New Year's Day. And for about, I think it was over 30 years, maybe 40 years, I went there every New Year's Day, wow. you know, and out with him. And then his friends would come. Tommy Kirk was there, who was, I knew oh. him from the time I get to, and George Meharris. So he had a lot of people, show business friends, and they were into cars, all those guys. And then a lot of professional, uh, you know, auto drivers, car drivers. 
And then by then, Tim had you know, become a somebody of note in, in the auto industry. He uh, was a writer for Car and Driver, Auto Trend. He'd written uh, two or three books on auto racing. In fact, that was I the no last idea. thing he did. He wrote a book, I think it was called Twice Around the Clock or something like that. Uh, and it's about auto racing in Le Mans in France. And it it's like, a, a, I think there's three books and they're all about 500 pages long. So it's a series of volume one, two, and three of everything about Le Mans so auto racing from whenever it started and the histories and the photos and just the most minute detail and minutia about racing. And wow. he knew it all and research. And he was a fabulous writer and these big cocktail table size books. I mean, they weren't cheap. They're like $350, $400. Oh uh, you'd, you'd have to be an, an auto aficionado, I guess, to, to want them and learn about auto racing on that detail. But yeah, for the past 15, 20 years, Tim and I, and uh, he invited us to go to the uh, Indy 500. So we've been doing that for 20 years till he passed away. In fact, I'm going again in a couple of weeks. Uh, the guy that he introduced us to is having us back again. So it's going to be kind of a strange time because Tim was always there. This will be yeah, the first time. He just passed away not that long ago, yeah. Yeah, he won't be there and the other guy that used to go with us is tony dow and his mm -hmm. wife so yeah it's going to be a little bit different but i just mm -hmm. saw the guy his name is mike lanigan and he was just out here for the uh, uh the long beach grand prix and he had three cars racing in it so got to hang out with mike for about three or four hours and on the saturday i didn't go to the race i just thought well i'd rather watch it on tv at home if i'm going to watch it because yeah. you can see it so yeah, you know, were you, were these... you uh, close with Tony, Tony Dow? Yeah, <laughs> Tony. Before I was in show business, Tony and I were swimmers and were uh, actually training to become divers. So I was probably about six, and Tony was probably about twelve, maybe. Wow. And we had this diving instructor, and about a year, maybe two later, Tony got cast in Leave It to Beaver. I didn't even know he was an actor. Or... And I don't think he knew I was trying. And then a couple of years later, I started getting things and, you know, started getting, I was started really on Ozzy and Harriet. That's where I got my first line of dialogue, which allowed me to join the Screen Actors Guild as an actor. I started doing movies. I did a TV pilot at the um, end of 1958 for Jackie Cooper called Skippy, which yep. I starred in. And that pilot, the reel of the pilot, got me most of my work. It got me Please and Eat the Daisies. And then the following year, it got me My Three Sons, that uh, the producers of the show were looking around for somebody, you know, the three sons, and they were looking for somebody to play the youngest son. And uh, somehow my agent borrowed the reel from Jackie Cooper, you know, sent it over mm -hmm. to Desi Lou at that time, and they screened it. And the next day, I got signed to play Chip Douglas. So. I mean, you didn't even audition. You just They just looked at the reel and said, that's well, it. I, skip you know why i didn't have to audition um i was literally on screen 90 percent of the time and the other half of the dialogue was mine and my name was above the title yeah uh, and it, with the you know stamp of approval from jackie cooper you know one of you know besides shirley temple he was the biggest child star there ever was oh so, without a doubt uh, how did you get it how did you get skippy yeah, well, he was a big producer in the industry by that time, producer and director, actually, and was doing a show called uh, The People's Choice. And then in 59, I think he started Hennessy. So it came with his blessings, and he let me out of the contract so that I could do it. But yeah, if you saw the work that I did that, but, you know, and right. I never did, saw it. How did you originally never... get Skippy itself? Oh, well, yeah, this is <laughs> basically because of a dog is <laughs> how I got it. What? I know it sounds... Um, when I was doing Ozzy and Harriet, I, you know, went on, I think I told you I was an extra. Uh, but when I wasn't, sh well, finally, I got a line that allowed me to join the guild. Ozzy said he would have me back again. And he did from 57 through 60. I probably did 15, 18 Ozzy and Harriet episodes. And he was actually writing episodes with me in mind. You know, the plot created around my little neighborhood Stanley character. Oh, cool. But when I wasn't shooting, there was, you know, downtime and I would go wandering around. Well, next door to us, there was a horse. And I remember I'd go over there because I was taking horseback riding lessons and talk to the trainer. And he'd put me up on the horse and let me ride out of the sound stage around the back where they had built a little stable for this horse. And was that Mr. Red? 
It was Mr. Ed, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. And then across from us, uh, during the noon hour, they would slide open the stage door, and there was a dog that was there with the trainer, and, you know, he'd take it out and walk it around. And I went over and started playing with him and introduced myself to the trainer, who eventually was the guy who was the trainer for Tramp. His name was Frank Ian. Wow. And, uh you know, I guess some guy saw me there every day when the sliding door would open and the dog would come out playing with this dog and walking it. And, you know, he would show me how to train and do different things. And yeah, this guy came up to me and started talking to me. And then I thought, oh my God, I'm probably in trouble, you know, because I don't have an adult around and no right, mom. And so right. he, is your mom around? And I, <laughs> I said, am I in trouble? And he goes, no, no, you're not in trouble, but I'd like to meet your mom. So I said, well, okay. So I walked him back onto stage five where we were shooting Ozzy and Harry and said, mom, this guy wants to meet you. <laughs> and then I walked away. So they said they're talking for about 15, 20, 30 minutes or something. And he left. And then next thing I knew, uh, he wrote a TV pilot for me called Skippy. And uh, which was, he was, Jackie Cooper made a movie called Skippy in 1934. Very and famous. It was, of the year yeah, it won the academy award the director won he won still the youngest person i think to be uh won a, an academy award in in the leading role uh position and uh so he saw something of himself in me and wrote this tv pilot and cast me in it i, I didn't even have to interview because he met me already and knew i could handle it wow. so uh wow. we shot it and then it didn't sell. It just kind of, you know, was there. And then I went on and started doing movies and other TV shows and stuff like that. And then uh, I think what happened was he, the um, show he was doing, uh, The People's Choice ended and he created another series for himself called Hennessy. So he kind of moved on to that. And this thing went on the, the back burner. And fortunately, uh, and like I said, it was a good show piece. My parents or my agent would borrow the reel occasionally from them to show it to casting people or producers and it got shown to all of my three sons and you know the rest is history as they say but had wow. it not been for Cleo, <laughs> it wouldn't have been over there and jackie cooper probably wouldn't have come up to me and introduced himself and that whole thing transpired hey um the other one you know i had john provost on and uh great yeah. guy by the way Lo love him and um, he told me that you were actually on Lassie, that you were in yeah. a, in, in an action, because I brought up, I said, hey, I heard there were some dangerous moments. He said, actually, there was one with Stanley Livingston. And he said that mm -hmm. you jumped into a pond, which, by the way, you bring up that you did diving with Tony Dow, and it made me think of this. He Where said were? you dove into the pond, and apparently the bottom of the pond was this thick mud, and it was actually quite dangerous. Yeah, it turned out to be dangerous. Well, that was one of my first jobs, and that's where I know. Well, actually, I knew John before that. You know, we'd been on interviews and stuff like that, so we were aware of each other. Wow. But in the uh, episode they called the transition episode, where Tommy Raddick was leaving the show, he'd kind of outgrown the show. I guess he was about 18, and the guy yeah, that played yeah. Porky, his name, um, John Vieira, or something like that. Uh, Anyway, they were leaving and a whole new family was moving into the farmhouse. It was June Lockhart and Timmy and instead of Jeff. And uh, yeah, I, I don't remember what the, the situation was, but uh, he let Jeff leaves Timmy the dog because he doesn't want to take him. He's moving to the city. And uh, I think Timmy's upset about moving to the, you know, to rural life and, and runs away and somehow falls into this lake or pond or whatever it was. And is almost supposed to drown. Well, I guess my agent knew his agent or something. They were looking around for a kid that could be his stunt double, basically. So my first stunt job. But basically, yeah, I went out there, had to fall into the water and then flail around in, in the water like I'm drowning and kind of do it in a way that I'd only come out of the water like that. And then I yeah. go back under up. Uh, so they couldn't see my whole face. Otherwise, you would have seen it. Yeah, although John and I, from a distance at that age, we both had you know platinum blonde hair, and we had our hair the same way. We we looked alike. So I remember they gave me his wardrobe, and then somebody came out to the pool. I don't remember who was the producer, or casting person, and I had to jump into the the water and pretend to drown. They go, okay, he'll do. You know, so I get out on. I'm thinking I'm gonna be in a pool, but you know, it turns <laughs> right. out it's just murky lake and even then i was having apprehensions about this um so yeah i i think i jumped off a 
bridge or there was something near that, that I had to jump into and then start flailing around. And then Lassie's barking on the shoreline to get the attention of the adult who goes running out into the water to get me. Well, when I started getting out there and, and going up and down, one of the times I went down, the water had so much sediment at the bottom. And I don't know if you've ever been in a pond. It's like Many goop. Times. Yeah, if you go in, the suction gets a hold of you. And when the suction got a hold of me, I was probably two feet underwater, not near the surface. So I was struggling to get free from it, just enough to get my mouth up to get another gulp of air before I went back Man. down. And anyway, it, it, it probably looked like I was drowning because guess what? I really was. I wasn't getting enough air. And that guy got out there and got me just in time and you know pulled me up out of the muck. And he's holding me. And my instructions from the director was, you know, go ahead and flail around. He's going to come out and he's going to pick you up. But when he lifts you up, you kind of turn your head to the, to the side because we're going to be shooting from that side so we don't see it's you. So, you know, we practiced a couple of times on shore before I did it so I knew which way to turn. And then, you know, I went out and did it for real and I got my stunt double credit. <laughs> God, that is pick. scary, though. When you're under the water like that, that is scary. Both about seven years old when I guess that I'm seven, eight years old. So, you know, and it's funny. That's another thing I never saw until recently. I don't know how I never. Well, I probably didn't watch the show. I didn't even watch my two sons, to be really honest. But yes. anyway, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I was looking. It might have been on YouTube. And I thought, gee, you know, what if that transition episode exists? And I typed it in that way, keyworded it. And uh, it came up. So I started watching it and got to the part where I that scene is there i never saw it before but yeah it looks pretty pretty cool and i took a couple of uh frame grabs just just to have it to say that i did it you know here i am out here you know drowning for john provost and to this day <laughs> fact, john one of the guys that goes back to the indy 500 with us uh he's he's one of the other guys that goes so it's, we have what we call the usual suspects <laughs> that's what we call yeah. ourselves or the unusual suspects, most more likely. Well, please uh, say hi to yeah. him and say hi to his wife Lori for me as well. Just yeah. uh, great, great people. Be, they they are yeah, and I love Lori too. In fact, I introduced them. I don't know where they mentioned that. They, no, I no, heard... she did. She did. She told me. <laughs> I said an autograph show. Yeah, and she was sitting next to me, and I think I was single, but I was I already had like this girl I was interested in and so i wasn't trying to date anybody else but i said hey you know i do have a friend <laughs> and so i called john over and said hey john i want you to meet you know laurie and they hit it off and you know, a couple of years later i think it was so we were all at their wedding that's so cool let me ask you something um i had read i read barry's book which by the way was excellent for anybody that's out there you should buy it it's it's a great one the importance and of being Ernie <laughs> the importance of being yeah it, it was it was great I really enjoyed it and uh but anyway I was going to say there was a moment in there where he talks about you getting your break and I know that you had mentioned earlier you, you and Tony did the diving together but I thought this was a wild story I I read that a photographer was there and shot through this window they had apparently in the pool and you're now am I, I correct this you're at the bottom of the pool on a bike <laughs> Yep, this lady that ran this swim school in Hollywood. Uh, I had a cousin who died about three years before I was born who drowned, and my mom was mortally afraid that Barry and I would die. Well, first me, because I was three years older than Barry. Mm -hmm. They moved to California, and she wanted to go to the swim school in, in Hollywood, on Hollywood Boulevard. The lady's name was Jen Lovin. It was huge, cool. And she taught infants uh, how to swim. Mm -hmm. And it could be anywhere from one to three you know when they would put you in the water and after a couple of months of uh, classes you knew how to swim so my mom didn't want me to drown so i don't know what her, made her think i was but she, and the lady from school is very entrepreneurial she would get uh, magazines to come down and shoot and what she had done is she cut a hole in the side of the pool is about a four foot hole a circular hole and had a real thick piece of glass installed there and you could go down the steps on the outside of it and see underwater. So what wow. she would do, she would take, remember car, little tricycles and bicycles and toy cars. You know, there was a car, one that looked like a fire engine. Another one was a tractor and put them underwater and we'd be driving around. And she would stage like auto accidents underwater. <laughs> and, um, 
a swing, a swing set. We'd be doing all that. It was cute. And it got a lot of notoriety, but a lot of period magazines. In fact, I, I just was looking at the other day, uh, a scrapbook and it was Vogue magazine came out and did a whole layout, but there was like life look and we we're called water babies. So we did that. And we also would dive off the high dive, which, you know, it was 12, 15 foot high wow. diving. We were like about that tall back then. And uh, because of that, a lot of Hollywood people started bringing their children there to learn how to swim. And then she finally got a, there was a show back in that era called uh, You Asked For It. And people would write in saying, you know, whatever they wanted to see. You know, I want to see a, a rocket being launched or I want to see a car race or I want to see these kids underwater called Water Babies. Well, I'm sure she was the one who wrote in. Wrote in, <laughs> yeah. But they did come out and cover it. And we were a segment of, of You Asked For It. And like I said, Hollywood people started bringing their kids to learn how to swim. Producers, directors, agents, casting people. And there was an agent whose daughter was learning how to swim. And, you know, I guess she saw me and I caught her eye. And uh, she started talking to my mom about, and I was pretty extroverted. And I guess I was cute with the blonde hair and outspoken. So she thought I had the uh, the right qualities uh, to be a child actor. And so wow. she finally convinced my mom to let let her send me out, you know, with the caveat that, uh, you know, I probably wouldn't get acting roles immediately. I'd be an extra, but I would, you know, get some experience on the set and see how it worked and be around other kids on the set and be exposed to other producers and casting people. So I did that. And yeah, for a while, I, I had no lines. And that's what happened on that final, like a cast on uh, uh, Ozzy and Harriet as an extra. And for I guess I caught his eye for whatever reason. He came up to me. We shot it a couple of times. He said, hey, I want you to say this line. And he goes, I'm going to put a piece of tape on the floor right here. Put a little X. And he goes, when you get right here, I want you to stop and look at me and say this line. I don't want you to look at the tape on the floor. So you just have to you know, look and know where you're going. And then I want you to turn, I think it was to the left and go out. So we shot again. And I you know, walked in and stopped where the tape was and looked up wow. at Austin. It sure is good camping in there, Mr. Nelson. And, and then I turned and left. And then he moved the camera closer, shot. I did a close up. And then he went up to my mom afterwards. And I guess I did okay because he said, I want you to leave your contact information with my secretary in the front office. I want to have Stanley back. And yeah, you know, but that's the oldest story in Hollywood. I want to have you back or see you again. And you never, ever, 50 years later, you've still never seen the person or they never hired you again. But Ozzy was true to his word from, you know, 57, I think is when I did that, to 1960 when I couldn't come back anymore after I did this particular episode because I got hired on My Three Sons. Uh, Unreal. In 15, 18 episodes, some of which he wrote for me. You know, I, I became like the favorite, I guess, neighborhood kid. And the funny thing is the very last episode I did for Ozzy, I had my brother, my brother Barry, you know. because Really? He, was in it, uh, and, and uh, he had a line, and he, I think the storyline was uh, he had made some T-shirts up for a club, and they had they printed it wrong, and he got somebody else's order, and it said "Welcome back, Skinny" on it, and so <laughs> to pawn him off on these kids because we we have a club, and he goes, "Well, yeah, you know, maybe you guys shouldn't be like the Tigers and the Vikings." He says, "I got these shirts, and they say Welcome back, Skinny,' and we're like, <laughs> hey, Mr. Nelson." And we were just all sitting there eating bowls of ice cream and, and berries in it. And he had a line. It was so funny. So cute. He's got the glasses, but just the way he's got ice cream, like all over him. And he was just like, couldn't care less about the scene. He was just scarfing up the ice cream. <laughs> it's so funny. And so when I left, uh, you know, Barry did a good job and, and they needed to replace me because by this point they were sort of dependent on me whenever they needed a, you know, a neighborhood kid. Wow. They replaced me with Barry, and Barry went on for the next three, four years before he became a regular My Three Sons. He probably did 20, 25 episodes of Ozzy and Harriet. I don't wow. know. I yeah. mean, seriously, that is a cool, that is really a cool story. So, now nah, it takes yeah. you back. Well, but, yeah, so that's that's kind of my acting career. And then like, oh. I, I I'm, got into producing and directing, and I've got a project right now that I'm doing called The Actor's Journey. Actually, it's done. We're going to be putting it up hopefully in another month or so. But it's a uh, program for actors. But it's not about, you know, the art and craft of acting. It's actually uh, teaches 
the business side of being an actor because there's this huge what I call a void yeah in taking your classes whether you take them at UCLA or you know some college some university a junior college or if you go to the actor studio or Yale or Harvard you just spend anywhere from 10 grand to 100 grand on learning how to act and then now you don't know how to get into the industry or whatever yeah, you know nothing about the business yeah that, so, that happens yeah I have an acting background I know here's the industry yeah. and in the middle there's this void that yep 90 percent 99 percent of the actors fall into never to be heard again after they spend all this time and money learning how to True. become actors. And I don't know why the college, well, I do know why the colleges, just uh, universities don't teach that aspect of it. And the industry, just like any business, is comprised of more than one component. It's not just acting. If that's all you know, it's not going to happen for you. So there is the business component. It's like running a restaurant. You can be the best chef in the world, but unless you know how to run a restaurant, it's you're going to be out of business like within oh, months. You'll be done. Yeah, you'll be done. Where can yeah. they get a hold of this? Where can they go to... To uh, well, it, it'll actually be up online. We originally had it as a DVD program mm -hmm. and I had to put it on the back burner because I started doing some other projects and I couldn't run the company, but I'm back to doing that again. But I don't want it to be a DVD program. We wanted it to be an online streaming program, which is kind of what's prevalent is today. Is there a website or is something? Called theactorsjourney.com. But the website right now is offline. I'm building sure. it. And then it'll be connected up to where it'll link up with the uh, material, the content. Mm -hmm. And like I said, 10 hour long program. I don't teach it. I was originally going to do that. And I thought, well, that's kind of presumptuous. So I brought in 100 people from the industry. Uh, who 100. Had, uh, hun over 100 who've had 20 to 30 years experience. Wow. 50 of these people have either won or been nominated for Academy, Emmy, Golden Globe Awards. And it's not just actors teaching actors about the business. I brought in directors, producers, showrunners, uh, casting directors, agents, managers. I had the president of the Screen Actors Guild at the time. Wow. I had one of the Directors Guild of America. I have about 20 people that were on various boards at both of those uh, entities. Um, and it's, yeah, some pretty amazing people stepped up to the plate. Of course, they were, you know, friends of mine that I could call yeah. upon Still. and to see if they were like-minded that uh, actors who really deserve to know this material uh, before <laughs> they get going with their uh, careers, if they get going at all, or it helps you get going. But, you know, people like Michael York or one of the people, Henry Winkler, uh, Danny Trejo, Sherman wow. Hemsworth. Uh, have brought in the director Richard Donner, who directed all the Lethal Weapon movies. Very Superman, famous, big directors, uh, casting people. Like I said, uh, yeah, it's huge. If you want to get a sampling of it, uh, what I put up is I had some promo clips so people could see who was involved. So I put up about, I think about fifty, sixty clips, and it's got uh, of the various people that on YouTube. Over. It's on YouTube. So if you go to the Actors Journey on youtube search that out uh, yeah you'll find I, I believe there's at least 50 clips of that more wow. some of these people talking about various aspects uh, that are related to the business but it's a 10 hour long program that walks you through everything from i don't know anything to you actually become a mega success which brings its own hardships and problems that you have to learn how to surmount and it, it covers everything from soup to nuts. It's I, I left no stone unturned as far as I'm concerned. Let's yep. do this. Let's plan then when this gets released. I'll um, let you know. We'll do email. another one and we'll just focus on that because I'd enjoy okay. that. When you get a chance, go to YouTube. And like I said, in the box, just type in The Actor's Journey. And you can, like I said, you'll see who's in it. And it'll it'll kind of blow you away. It's kind of neat because you know, it's just face after face comes at you that you're, oh my, oh, whoa, whoa look who's, you know, it's kind of that thing. Look who's there. I, I got to see that for sure. All cool, right. Oh, great Thank talking you so with much. You. Yeah, we'll talk again. Thanks again for listening. And if you'd like to see the additional content or my newsletter, as well as all the other additional things that you can get, uh, please go to patreon.com slash that's classic.